Chapter 6 Uma Uma is my heartbeat. I love her more than I love myself. I care about what she thinks and has to say. Easily, I would give my life to save hers. Yet, every day I strive to stay alive because losing my life would kill her. As Uma's firstborn and a son, we are closer than skin is to flesh. Without exchanging any words, I know many of her thoughts. Her feelings are extremely intense, so sometimes I have to leave her presence to avoid being swallowed by them. From age seven until now at 14, I've held her hand in mine and led her into America. I have translated everything she saw and heard. I've spoken for her in the offices of immigration, at the lawyer's office, at the bank and realtors. Every day, I had to pay close attention to everyone, what they were saying and doing in regards to my mother and had to read and interpret documents they wanted her to sign that were even difficult for me to understand. Ours is a closeness that only a foreigner in a foreign land who cannot speak the common language might really understand. Still, our closeness is more. Clearly, I know the difference between a father, a husband, and a son. I wanted to be the best son possible, not only because my father said to do it, not only because I am her only son, but also because she deserved it, and I love and respect her beyond anyone else. Uma is the opposite of every female that I saw or knew so far in America. She doesn't change her mind every few seconds, minutes, or months. She is steady. Her love and loyalty are forever. Her friendship is something you can count on. She is an amazing talent, while being so modest and down to earth. She is a young wife and mother, and an extremely attractive woman without conceit. She doesn't need or want everyone to look at her or to give her compliments all day to feel all right about herself. She is an incredible cook who fills every one of her dishes and pots at every meal with love. After eating, you could feel the love growing in your belly and strengthening your body. She is a hard worker, but always pleasant. She is so smart, yet so unselfish. Even when she criticizes, she is accurate, but soft and always sweet. The best thing about her is her certainty. Her belief in and dedication to Allah is unshakable. You could see it in her every action every day, without her preaching a word of it. Her family is her life. Uma's love for my father is like radiation, something active and extreme that's in each speck of the atmosphere every day. Since leaving the North Sudan, where Uma was born, raised, married, and gave birth, I do not mention her husband, my father, because mentioning missing him will set off a tidal wave of her emotions and desires and a typhoon of her tears that could only drown everyone and everything in its path. We live life like he is right here beside us in the United States. We bow down and pray to Allah together at the same time each and every day. When we first touched down at John F. Kennedy Airport in America, we were supposed to be received, cared for, and guided by one of my father's American friends his former roommate while studying at Columbia University. We were both surprised when he never showed up and never responded to our many phone calls, especially after my father phoned him from the Sudan and told him, I am sending my heart overseas. She is with my young son and carrying also my daughter in her womb. The roommate became permanently pressed in Uma's mind as the symbol of an American welcome and the measure of American friendship. On our first day in New York, once we made it outside of JFK Airport in Queens, we took a taxi to New York City. We checked into a midtown Manhattan hotel recommended by the cab driver. At the Parker Meridian, instantly we became familiar with the weight of the American dollar, as each night's stay in our hotel room equaled a month of Sudanese dinars in high living. At the concierge's desk in the hotel lobby, I collected information and got a few answers to our questions, as well as a map of the city of New York, including all of its five boroughs and a subway guide. For a month, Uma and I lived in our hotel room trying to figure things out. We walked the streets and learned to ride the train together, making and carrying out our plans. It wasn't long before Uma revealed that the shock of this new place and the weird people and things we saw every day were making her sicker than she was supposed to be in her third month of pregnancy. On the train, she would comment to me that the women in this country must all be in mourning because they wore no henna on their hands. Back home, 
Women with undecorated hands and feet were either unmarried, uncelebrated, or widowed. Henna was a sign of happiness, good fortune, good health, good life, and beauty. The train rides were a source of shock for her, sinking beggars with either no legs or no arms or both. Foul-mouthed youth who wouldn't stand up and make room for elderly ladies or women traveling with babies and young children. Once there was this man in his 30s, drenched in the smell of cheap wine, who attempted to stand directly in front of where Uma sat before I moved him out of her way. The last straw was when a homeless man seated beside us turned out to be dead. Two young transit workers got onto the train, then stood around arguing over who was going to clean up the pool of watery shit that filled his seat after his body was removed. While shopping in the random fruit stores, Uma would say that the fruits here looked abnormal and strangely large. So many of the fresh tropical fruits she craved were missing from the midtown stores, like dates, guava, tamarind, and apricots. In the supermarkets we checked out, she would say that the raw chicken looked bloated and swollen and unusually yellow, as if someone had intentionally painted them with an unnatural color. In the fish market, she would recoil at the stinking smell, saying fresh fish had a distinctive scent, but did not have a foul odor. Even the coffee served in the coffee shops was an insult to her. I guess this was not surprising since Sudanese coffee ranks as one of the best tasting coffees prepared in the world. Uma spit up even the New York drinking water, saying it was awful and tasted impure. I never doubted her words. On our estate, our water was drawn from our fresh water wells. Back home, she picked fruits off our trees, plucked and poured vegetables from our gardens and fields, crushed fresh coffee beans, fried them, and brewed everyone's coffee. She cooked incredible stews and baked fresh breads and was so accurate in her mixture and blends of spices that an invitation for dinner at our place was never turned down, but instead was met with great excitement and anticipation. I knew and Uma impressed upon me that we had to find affordable housing and a comfortable living space before our monies dwindled down to nothing. So far, we had spoken with many professionals who were all clear and specific about the money they wanted from us as payment. Yet they were cloudy and vague about what they would actually do to earn the money they were requesting and quick to add that they could not guarantee us any results. Uma sensed they were liars and cheaters under the banner of business. Most things we were left to figure out for ourselves. The urgency pushed me to ask Uma to relax in the hotel room and venture out on my own. I listened as she recited a list of things she wanted and we needed. I put some of our money into my pocket. Then I left to go make it happen. In the evenings, I would return and give her the items I had purchased. Also, I gave her an update on some of the things that happened in my day, careful not to mention anything that would disturb or upset her or cause her to know how people here try to boss and cheat a young kid as if I couldn't count or think straight. Brooklyn is where I discovered a row of Arab-owned stores where the spices Uma cooked with back home were available for sale. Cardamom, ginger, turmeric, coriander, cumin, cayenne, mustard seeds, fennel, and a host of hot peppers. There were dates, tamarinds, apricots, eggplant, okra, lentils, and chickpeas. There was an assortment of Middle Eastern and African flowers, which she would use to prepare our breads. They even had a barrel of pumpkin seeds. I picked up a bag as a treat for Uma, who ate and enjoyed them back home from time to time. When I brought my info and a few treats back to the hotel and spoke of the row of Arab-owned stores, a supermarket, a takeout falafel shop, a jewelry store, and the mosque, Uma wanted to see the places for herself. She chose to explore the Brooklyn Mosque first. When we entered, an Arab man greeted me and ignored her. When I asked if we could make prayer, he welcomed me and pointed Uma toward a closed door which led to a dark, damp basement area where women were designated to pray separately from the men. We were used to men and women praying separately in one space, women behind the men. We were not accustomed to males praying on one level, leaving the women down below. It was the cold winter season outside and colder in the dungeon. It was unsuitable for any woman, especially a pregnant one. He expected Uma to go down there alone. I grabbed her hand to escort her out of there. Uma turned to the Arab man and, speaking in Arabic, stated, Do you think that because you are in America that Allah cannot see you and what you are doing? 
He seemed surprised that we spoke his language. He never answered her question, though. As we left, Uma said, America, where Muslims play and do what they would never do back home. Now she was content to keep our prayers privately. She never asked about the local mosque again. Brooklyn was also the place where I discovered a bookstore that let me order books printed in Arabic. It was a rainy day. I was amazed at the unfamiliar combination of cold temperature and the freezing downpour of ice water onto my shoulders and back. I stepped under the canopy of one of the stores and stood shivering and facing a bookstore named The Open Mind, built on the triangular tip of two intersecting blocks. I shot across the street and entered a place with thousands of books for sale neatly arranged in a tight maze of tall shelves. Aside from the books, the place appeared to be empty. As I looked around at the headings, mysteries, biographies, hobbies, adults only, entrepreneurs, magazines, and children's, I was interrupted by a short Jewish man wearing wired frame glasses and a mustache. He folded his arms across his chest like some adults do when they are trying to establish authority over a child. I didn't respond to it because I didn't look at him as a parent or guardian over me. No school today? He asked. I ignored his question and treated him like a bookseller because that is what he was. If he was a good one, I was planning to be a book buyer. Do you have a book series called The Amazing Adventures of Akbar? I asked. He repeated the name of the series aloud and scrunched up his face like he was trying to solve a difficult math problem. I have a children's section over there to the left, but I don't believe I have ever heard of this series, he admitted. Thanks anyway. I turned to leave. Wait, he said, calling behind me. I can order the books for you if you'd like. I must have looked skeptical because he continued to try to convince me. Ten days or two weeks, I'll have them right here in my store for you, he said. Do you know the name of the author? Yes, it's Bashir Hussein. The series is written in Arabic, I told him. His face lit up. Where are you from? He asked. Where are you from? I turned the question around on him. No, really, he asked me again. I just came from the number two train, I answered him. He smiled, unfolded his arms, and threw up his hands, saying, Bravo. Okay, kid, you win. I see you're a tough one. But you like books, so I like you. Come back in two weeks, and I will have your series for you. If not, then I'm not Marty Bookbinder. He held out his hand to me. I shook it. Two weeks later, when I returned to the open mine, I entered the store and walked around quietly, wondering how this guy survived in this business when I had yet to see him with a customer besides myself. I saw him shoot past me in the maze of shelves without acknowledging that I was standing there. I took that to mean he did not get the books I ordered and didn't feel like facing me. I turned to walk out. He shouted after me, Hey, I have your series. Surprised, I turned back around and followed him to the section where he kept the new books shelved. Naturally, I smiled as I saw volumes 1 through 21 of the series my father first chose for me right there in front of my face in this foreign land. I'll take volumes 15 through 21, I told Marty. That's seven books, he said to me. I thought it was a dumb comment that implied I either did not know that already or could not count for myself. Each book is seven fifty, he said. I put my $52.50 on the counter plus 8% sales tax. Put them in a bag, please, I said. What about the other volumes, he asked. I picked up my bag and answered. I read them already. I left the store thinking of how much I hate to be underestimated. Wait a minute, he followed me. What's your name, he asked. Maybe next time, I told him. That's an interesting name, he laughed. Listen, please come again. I'll teach you how to play chess. Do you play chess? He asked. Chess? Maybe next time, I said again. Down that same block, I found a friendly Jewish realtor. I explained to her that my mother didn't speak any English, but we were looking for a place to stay. She was the one who eventually led Uma and me to the Brooklyn Projects into a three-bedroom apartment on the sixth floor. She showed it to us like it was the ideal place for the ideal price. She charged us three months' rent in advance. Somehow, only two months' worth of the money we gave her counted. 
The third month's rent, she said, was her fee for locating the apartment for us. The bottom line was we were never suspicious that the realtor had led us into a hell reserved for poor blacks. We didn't know about the crime rate, the condition of African Americans, hostile policing, illegal drugs, welfare, food stamps, or Medicaid. All we knew was the monthly rental price was an amount that we could afford to pay without Uma having to work for the first year while she gave birth to and began breastfeeding and raising the baby, who my father assured us was a daughter. With the keys to our new apartment in my hands, I went in and scrubbed the walls, toilet, and tub with Dedo. I swept, washed, and waxed the floors in every room. I cleaned all of the windows. I taught myself how to use the stove and oven. I cleaned it out as well as the refrigerator. The job took so long to complete that I never made it back to the hotel where Uma was hand washing and hang drying her favorite cloths and packing our few belongings. She did not trust the hotel laundress to do the job. I spent my first night alone in the apartment with the windows slightly open so the cold breeze would clear out the antiseptic smell of all of the detergents. On the hard, newly sparkling floor, I lay down and listened to the sounds and noises of elevator doors opening and closing, my neighbors walking and children running through the hallways, and even more milling in the streets. Lying there with the view of a starless sky as black as ink, I thought about my southern Sudanese grandfather. I had learned not to fear the darkness and the unknown spending summer side by side with the boys of his village. Learning and playing and training with more than 20 or so boys my same age gave me crazy confidence. When we would hear the sounds of the creatures of the night, we did not fear. They had a crew and we had a crew. We knew from watching the boys who were older than us that if we worked together, we would rule over the animals instead of them ruling over us. I felt extra secure in this village. After all, my own grandfather was born and raised there, and my grandfather was the only man greater than him. My grandfather taught me to see in the dark, not just to look, but to see. He would sit so still in the dark of the African night. He was so black that only a trained eye could distinguish him from the atmosphere. So he would play on it. I would walk into his large hut. He would have the lamps off on purpose. I would move around feeling as though I was completely alone in there. Suddenly, he would grab me with his rough hands. His deep voice would fill the room. When he would laugh at my foolishness and not being able to see him, only his white sparkling teeth would reveal his actual location. What if I were the King Cobra? He would ask with the threat animated in his voice. He played these games with me until I learned to pay attention, to see in the dark, to not bump into anything in my surroundings because I needed to form a mental picture of it. Since Uma was asleep alone in the hotel, I made sure I was back in Manhattan by the time she opened her eyes and in time for prayer. Dialing the combination that unlocked the hotel safe, I took Uma's jewels, the few we managed to bring from back home, and wrapped them in one of her colorful silk scarves. I carried them on my back, secured in my backpack. She folded the remaining cloths, which had now dried, and packed our few pieces of luggage. We checked out of the hotel once and for all, paying a large amount of American dollars. Inside of seven days, Uma transformed our small Brooklyn apartment into a very modest Sudanese home. The first thing she did was fill each room with a powerful scent of sandalwood from back home. From the ceiling to the floor, she hung newly purchased lavender curtains to cover the living room windows and even the clean but bland off-white walls. She handmade huge, colorful, bejeweled suede purple pillows and placed them onto the sparkling floors. Aside from a beautiful dark brown walnut table that we purchased from an antique shop on the other end of Brooklyn, we had only a few selected pieces of furniture. I admit that when we would return from the outdoor coldness, Uma's fragrances and the color scheme she selected would warm us right up. Buying a music system for the living room, a special grill and hot plate for Uma to cook breads and Sudanese food the way she wanted to, plus a serving tray and coffee and tea sets, as well as 10-pound bags of long grain rice and an array of beans, olives, grains, and vegetables, honey, yogurt, fruits, fresh-cut flowers, and halal meats brought the cost of moving in way beyond what we had projected. We also ended up having to hire movers to pick up our furniture and bed sets because most of the stores wouldn't deliver to our neighborhood. 
we don't go over there, various store owners insisted. It was our first hint that something wasn't right. Even though our new surroundings inside our apartment looked great and were soothing, an unspoken sadness weighed heavy on our hearts. More than anything, we knew not to speak on any of it. It was as if just a simple mention of what was actually happening in our lives would bring the ceiling crashing down onto our heads. After our telephone was installed, I would see Uma pick up the receiver and, one by one, dial several long-distance phone numbers. The only thing was there would never be a conversation. Only her gripping the telephone and sitting silently and waiting and eventually hanging up and saying nothing to me of what was going on. In her room, she would be writing furiously. She would stop the instant I appeared. She would put her papers to the side or in a drawer and not speak on it. I was not concerned about the content of her writings. It was only her I was concerned about, her feelings, and exactly how to make a true smile spread across her face again, as it always had back home. Very soon, Uma confided to me that she would have to find a job. At the same time, she wanted to sign me up to start in an American school. But she also realized that she could not do both. She needed me to help her search for a job. She needed me to speak English to them and translate their English back to her. I was against the idea of her working while carrying my sister. I felt my father would not like it either. But if she was going to be traveling outside to meet potential employers, I was definitely going along with her. So when she was six and a half months pregnant, I found a job for Uma working at a fabric factory, a building located inside a group of warehouses where women, most of them foreign, worked on industrial machines lined up in rows. I spoke to the manager there who offered Uma part-time work due to her pregnancy at $3 per hour. He said if Uma was good, she could be bumped up to full-time after she gave birth. I liked that there were mostly women working there on the floor where all the sewing was being done. I did not like that all the bosses were men. Back home, Uma's clothing business was run from top to bottom exclusively by African women. The best part about the Russian-born Israelis who ran the factory was that they didn't make a big deal about Uma's Islamic attire. And when I explained that Uma couldn't speak English, one of the bosses asked, Does this look like a talking place to you? Show up on time, work fast, and work hard. That's it, the second boss chimed in. So I escorted Uma to the factory each time she went and picked her up at the end of every workday. We rode the trains together. At work and in public, she remained covered from head to toe, beneath the hijab and behind a niqab, veil. No one could see her except me. Her modest clothing gave me a chance to grow up without having to fight grown men all day, every day. Her modest clothing kept me from having to hurt anybody, especially on my Brooklyn block. My sister Naja was born in a Brooklyn hospital that some fool had the good mind to name the Kings County Hospital, a place where no one was treated royal. Uma was left alone in a room lying down with impatient and unprofessional health care workers, angry that she could not speak English and bent on keeping me, her translator, in a separate area. As I pressed them at the front desk to call the doctor, one nasty lady in a colorful medical jacket pointed her fat crooked finger at me and said, Do you see all these people out here? I did see them, tens of them lying on tables, some in the rooms, others pushed against the walls and lined up in the hallways. Some of these people have been shot. Has your mother been shot? She asked me with a monster mug face. No, alhamdulillah, I answered, meaning, no, Uma has not been shot, thank Allah. Living in Brooklyn, I had seen guns being aimed and triggers being pulled and shots being fired and gangsters and thieves and pimps and shootouts. But nothing was scarier than this woman's hatred and disregard for human life. Why couldn't she understand what Uma was going through? She was a woman, too. Then I decided that she was really nothing but an empty shell with a booming voice and hold where the heart is supposed to be. I could not imagine that she had ever been anybody's mother or friend. So she has to wait then. The doctor will see the most important cases first. My sister didn't wait. Uma was drenched in sweat when she burst out. Uma jumped off the table and caught her before her eight pound body could hit the floor. Later I found out that the monster lady was not even a nurse. 
Somehow someone in America had given out colorful medical jackets to the most uneducated, untrained people in the world and left them there to care for the sick and newborn. A real nurse showed up eventually and said that Uma should have been under a doctor's care throughout her entire pregnancy. She blamed Uma and covered for the crazy lady who yelled at us, explaining that we showed up at the wrong door of the hospital. Uma said we would have to take good care of ourselves and my newly born sister Naja to make sure that we all remained healthy. Otherwise, Uma explained, we will fall victim to the American hospital, which should be called the American morgue. The first day we carried Naja to the apartment was the first day we received a real visit from a neighbor. She was named Miss Marcy. We already knew her because she was an elderly lady who I once helped to carry her groceries inside the building. Uma said that old people are always attracted to babies. Through me, Miss Marcy asked about Naja often. Sometimes she invited Uma over for small talks and hot drinks. Since Uma could not really communicate with Miss Marcy, we knew she really wanted to spend time with the baby. Uma accepted Miss Marcy as her only neighborhood acquaintance. She said she missed the wisdom, warmth, and love of the elders that she once had back home. Eventually, Miss Marcy became the only person in our hood allowed to see, touch, and care for my infant sister, Naja. At home, I assisted in every way possible. I thought it was amazing, this newborn life. Since all we had was each other, I learned more about infants than I ever would have back home. In the Sudan, our newborns are surrounded by aunties and a host of women of every age who handle everything. Where I am from, a male would usually never interfere in the areas that the women control and are better suited for. When Uma was breastfeeding Naja once, I asked her what was she thinking when she was in the hospital lying on her back and felt Naja come flying out. She said, I didn't think at all. It was a mother's instinct and catching Naja was the same as catching myself. Uma and I grew closer every day and depended on each other and no one else. We made up certain rules between us and even had an emergency plan if anything seemed to have happened to one of us. In our rooms, both of us always kept one piece of packed luggage in case we suddenly had to make a move. We weren't expecting anything bad to happen, but we both learned that things do happen even when you don't expect it. When Uma, Naja, and I were inside our Brooklyn apartment, we were inside our own little Sudanese world. We adjusted and trusted and believed only in us three. There was only love in there. What went on outside our door we tolerated, dealt with, and handled. I kept my fury for the streets. Inside, we were determined to maintain our traditions, ways of being and doing. And we were steadfast in our Islam.